Show of hands, who recognizes the stage names The Undertaker, The Ultimate Warrior, or Rowdy Roddy Piper? Now a show of hands for who out there realizes I can't see you raise your hands. Welcome to the Just Dumb Enough podcast, a show that acknowledges no one is always an expert by dispelling misconceptions with real experts. I'm your host as always, Colton Petrie. My guest today is Chris Whaley. Chris was a professional wrestler who turned holy man of God. He also had a movie produced about his life called The Masked Saint that went up for some awards and even won. He's here today to discuss what those early days of wrestling were like and the way he handled his later years because of that lifestyle. Let's get ready to wrestle! Hopefully that's not copyrighted. Welcome to the show, Dr. Chris Whaley. Hey, thank you for having me, man. It's a real treat to be with somebody like you. (laughs) Thank you so much. I'm so glad to have you on the show. Why don't you give a bit of an introduction about yourself for the people listening? Okay. Well, I was a professional wrestler for 10 years, 1978 to 1988, and then I uh, became a pastor. And once I became a pastor, um, started handling some people more so as a professional wrestler than as a pastor, which was a little unusual, uh, and just had incident after incident after incident. I thought, you know, this would make a great TV series. Uh, Michael Landon used to be one of my favorites. You know, he had uh, The Little House on the Prairie and Highway to Heaven. They were good moral shows. And uh, when he died, nobody picked up the mantle for that. And I said, boy, this would make a great Michael Landon type series. And after I, uh, I wrote the book, I had um, a movie producer. The matter of fact, the guy that produced the first three Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies, the ones that were blockbusters, uh, he lives here in Orlando and he contacted me and I talked with him for almost a year. A script was written, and it looked like it was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, he changed his mind and said no. And and then during that time, I met other people in the movie business and had a a producer from Canada that flew down here and met me at Disney World, as a matter of fact. Uh, Very interested in making it into a movie. And then he later called me in 2013 and said, uh, we're going to make it into a movie. It was filmed. In 2013, uh, it was uh, the 2015 uh, Best Picture at the uh, International Christian Film Festival. So uh, ever since that time, I've had the great pleasure of talking to people, meeting with people, going to speak. And a lot of people have read the book and seen the movie, and they like to ask a lot of questions. So uh, it's just been a real real hoot being able to do that for the last several years and what an i mean an interesting story so far like what was it like joining pro wrestling in such an early day was that like extremely underground or was it starting to kind of catch on everywhere you know in my day uh there were 26 territories all across the united states florida was a huge territory georgia the carolinas Texas was a huge territory with the Von Erichs in East Texas and the Funks in West Texas and Husky in South Texas. Uh, The West Coast, I mean, the East Coast was big, but the West Coast was uh, growing like crazy. And you you would wrestle in a territory for a while and then go to another territory. But then a guy named Vince McMahon Jr. took over the WWF, which is now the WWE, And he was a marketing genius. And so he made professional wrestling from a regional sport to a national and international. He was an unbelievable marketer, uh, signed a contract with USA, NBC. And then he was also the first one to do a pay-per-view. 
And it was just incredible what he was doing. Well, that shut all the territories down because they could not compete with that. And then all of the talent in those territories gravitated to the WWF at that time. And so Vince, you know, was on top of the world with the greatest talent in the world in professional wrestling, the greatest venues and everything. And uh, uh, what was good for me is I was getting out about the time all of that was happening. I got out in 1988. Uh, a lot of the guys that I worked with uh, in Texas, uh, I worked with uh, Mark Calloway, who is the undertaker. And I worked uh, with uh, the uh, ultimate warrior. And those days, I think they called him the dingo warrior and had the opportunity to work with so many great guys that later went on, become superstars in the WWE. But in my day, I, I if you said, you know, would you rather have it the way it is today or the way it was in my day? I, I would take it the way it was in my day. If wrestling was just greater. Uh, you didn't have a lot of the, the garbage that's going on now. It was just uh, great talent in the ring, you know, putting on a great show for people. And um, you, had, you had great matches. Today, you know, unless you have high spots and everything, people have become so enamored with the high spots and everything that if they want to see a good, just a technical wrestling match, uh, you know, it's kind of boring to them. So, but anyway, I would take it in my day as opposed to today. Yeah. And was there like a large schedule change? Cause I know I've heard a lot of people like, especially in early wrestling, when the WWE was picking up, they like is extremely busy and still is somewhat to this day where like the schedule is extremely demanding. Was it always that way? Or is that something that came around with Vince McMahon? No, it was pretty much that way, you know, here in Florida, which is a huge territory, you know, they had uh, wrestling, I think in Orlando on Monday night, Tuesday night, it was in Tampa and Wednesday night, it was in another place and Thursday night. And so literally, you know, seven nights a week, uh, you had wrestling in the state of Florida in some area. And uh, you would you would wrestle six and seven times a week. So it was pretty, pretty demanding. If anything, with the WWE, it became, I think, a little bit less demanding because they had the, the huge shows all over the country. But uh, they certainly needed time for travel and things like that. So. Um, I think things were busier in our day than they are today. Wow. Interesting. Was there like as much demand to have all the character work that there is now? Cause I understand there's quite a lot of, you know, like story that goes into everything. Well, you know, with the WWE now, I mean, they have people that that's all they do is work on storylines and they do all of that. We, we really didn't have that in our day. You had the, you basically had the promoter, uh, you know, telling you what's, what was going to go on. And you had your, you had your gimmick. Now the great thing was if you had a gimmick in here in Florida and it really wasn't working that well, but you had an idea for something, you go to another territory and you try that, uh, that new gimmick out. And then later you can come back to Florida with that gimmick, you know? And so it was uh, not as technically, driven in my day as it is today but you just can't say enough about what vince mcmahon has done i mean he has just revolutionized uh it's no longer sports sports entertainment and he just changed everything uh, but we, i i thought i thought our day was just as good as far as talent wise and all we just didn't have all of the uh the uh, little technical things that vince has today yeah it's just a lot of skill and stamina mm -hmm. and th some really thick skin to do it quite often. Absolutely. That's exactly right. So coming out of pro wrestling, what was the drive to get out of it? Well, wrestling was my dream. And when I say dream, I, I grew up a sickly kid. I was constantly in and out of the hospital while I was growing up. Uh, mostly with pneumonia. In the uh, fourth grade, I had polio, I had viral encephalitis, and um, I was in the hospital for three months, had to learn to walk all over again. Uh, 
they couldn't figure out why my immune system was not working. But I had a great doctor who refused to allow me to give up. And he, you know, kept fighting to see what was wrong with me. Uh, finally sent me to a clinic in Central Florida. They were able to find out that uh, the reason my immune system was not working was because of all of the allergies. I had over 200 allergies. So I was literally allergic to everything. So they put me on this medication to combat the allergies. And then all of a sudden, boom, I started putting on weight. And this uh, doctor also uh, is the one that encouraged me to go to the gym and start working out, doing cardio and things like that. And when I went to the gym, I just uh, really enjoyed it. I, t- I still I still enjoy going to the gym, but um, I just really uh, started to change. My body started to change. And uh, when I was in the hospital, uh, late at night, you get your days and nights mixed up, but late at night, you know, there wasn't a lot on TV. And about the only thing on TV in those days was professional wrestling. And so as a kid, I just, I dreamed of doing that, never thinking that I would have the opportunity to do it. But I did, you know, I got to fulfill it. But when I was in college, my life changed and uh, I became a, I became a Christian and I felt, uh, I felt the call of God on my life uh, to be a pastor. So wrestling was my dream, but the ministry was my calling. And so my last three years in professional wrestling was while I was getting a Master of Divinity degree from uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. So the whole time that I'm there, even though I'm going to seminary in the daytime and wrestling at night, I'm thinking about my calling. You know, I'm doing my dream, but I'm thinking about my calling. And when I graduated from seminary in May of 1988, uh, my wrestling career was over at the age of 34, you know, 34 years old, which is really, I was at the height of my career. And now I'm leaving that and going into uh, the ministry. So I was, ex- you know, I knew that I was going to be doing this, but uh, I'll be honest with you, Colton. It was just, it was amazing how quickly life changed for me. I just, it's like one day I'm in professional wrestling and the next day I'm on my way to my first church. And I, I didn't get to go out the way that I wanted to go out whenever I got out of wrestling. But, uh, but I don't have any regrets. You know, I've been a minister now for uh, over 35 years and I wouldn't change that a bit. It still seems like such a difficult thing to say, like, I have achieved my dream you know, I'm, I'm doing it. I am in my peak, you know, but there's just, there is now something more I want to do. And, you know, not like there is a, a, a professional circuit for working uh-huh. in the ministry, but you, you were <laughs> like, I got to start over. Like I'm going, yeah. I'm going back to entry level. That's, yeah. that's quite a maneuver. Yeah. It, you know, uh, people have asked, often asked me uh, when I had the opportunity to speak at different events and stuff, they say, which one was more difficult, uh, wrestling or the ministry? And I say, uh, hands down, the ministry was more difficult. Uh, I never had stress in my life whenever I was in wrestling because I, I got to get my stress out in the ring, you know. But when you change that and you're going, you're dealing with people all the time. Well, you dealt with people in professional wrestling, but, you know, the promoter pretty well uh, is, the, is the guy that determined that. The promoter determines who wins, who loses, and you don't have any choice in that. And your your whole job is just to, to look as good as you can while you're in the ring and to make the other guy look good, too. And then you go to the world of ministry and then you're dealing with uh, you're dealing with volunteers that most churches run with volunteers and you're dealing with a faith based budget. Uh, When businesses build budgets, you build a budget based upon, you know, supply and demand and all of those other things. But in the ministry, you're totally dependent upon uh, faith based giving. And uh, I used to have a mentor that told me, he said, you can always tell when uh, things are not going well in a church. 
you said you'll see your attendance go down and your giving go down. And I don't care if you're the greatest pastor in the world. Sometimes being a pastor to people is like herding cats, you know, because they just, uh, they never do what you expect them to do. And, you know, you have people that are leading different positions and churches, volunteers, and they're not really qualified to do that. And so you have to you have to live with a lot of ups and downs in the ministry, mainly because you're just dealing with people all the time and the stress is insurmountable. Well, and, uh, you know, working in professional wrestling, like you have a bad night. Some people might not be as entertained or they don't get quite what they want out of the night. You have a bad day as a minister, like you might be dealing with people's you know, very severe emotional, personal problems. Yeah. And, and not only that, Colton, you're dealing with, uh, you know, when you, when you preach on Sunday, you're, you're hoping to knock it out of the park, you know, when you deliver a message and you can't hit a home run every time you get up to bat, you know, you're going to have some good messages, but you're going to have some that are less than good. It's a, it's a lot of stress doing that. And then, you know, those things just don't fall out of heaven on rice paper either. You have to prepare your your sermons and you have to prepare them. Uh, you have to speak to the people on what they're dealing with on a daily basis. And you you got to make sure that that message is relating to those people that you're out that, that are out there that you're talking to. So it it can be very, very stressful doing that. And there's some amount of like preparing your performance in both these things right like Mm -hmm. in pro wrestling you've got to know the people you're working with and the kind of show you're going to put on the kind of audience you're performing for and i have to imagine there's some of that in the church like you get to know your audience a little better because they're Mm -hmm. much more consistent i would hope and you know sometimes like you said you just know like all right i'm going to deliver this message is it one of those where you're like I know it's a good message, but it's going to be very underwhelming. So I'm going to set this up knowing that the next, you know, next Sunday, like I'm going to come in with just a home run of a speech and we're going to really kill it next week. So I'm okay taking the hit today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's very perceptive because today there, you know, the majority of, uh, pastors do a series you do a series of messages sometimes you know five weeks six weeks uh, or or longer and so when you're doing a series each week is building you know to the next week and all so that makes it makes it a little bit easier but uh, that's a, a very perceptive look at things the way you did not not being in the ministry you nailed it Well, I mean, I can just see where it's coming from. You know, like you said, you just can't hit a home run every week. That would be an outstanding record for anyone in any field at any point in time. But you have kind of the ability to like pre-measure, you know, what you're going to say where you're like, okay, I just, I know that I have to kind of give like, this is going to be the low week and I've still got to give it my all, but I know like the outcome's going to be less. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the same thing is with you, you know, you want every interview you do to be a home run. And unfortunately, sometimes you get somebody, no matter what you do, it's not going to be as interesting as you would hoped it to be. And hopefully that's not the case with this interview, but uh, (laughs) I know that you have the same difficulty dealing with that on a, you know, every time you do an interview, you want it to be a home run. Yeah. And there's a certain amount of bizarre nature to this show specifically because my topics fluctuate so wildly by design that like sometimes they seem wildly disconnected where you're like these things are not opposites they're just have zero in common so i have no idea what i'm expecting in the next episode and that's fun like to me you know i get to talk to people like yourself and this is a very different conversation than i was having you know last week with someone who is an expert pole dancer at a gym where they're like, yeah, I train people to do this very specific exercise. And I'm like, you know what? That has almost nothing in common with. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, going from a pole dancer to a professional wrestler. That's a big one. Yeah. yeah. 
I can say yeah. like, oh, well, there's some exercise. But I'm like, one of these is actually like her version is extremely private classes. So it's yeah. not an entertainment venue. So I can't really call it that. <laughs> yeah. Like, and yeah. it's been, you know, she went from like psychology into, you know, gym essentially for pole dancing. Yeah. And I'm like, you went from professional wrestling over to ministry and I can't draw good parallels. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, in the ministry, you're still dealing with battles every week. You're dealing with battles. And the same thing with, uh, you know, professional wrestling. You're dealing, you're dealing with a different battle every time you go into the ring. And, you know, some of the guys you work with were great to work with. And then there were some of the guys you worked with, you were you were very thankful when the match was over. And and I had some of those too, believe me. Yeah. So you had said, you know, when you came into the ministry, you were still kind of dealing with things like a professional wrestler. All right. Is that just like it was where your mindset was, you know, just from the previous career? Or how was that all going down? Well, I I just even to today, I just detest bullies. You know, bullies are are people who pick on people they know they can defeat. I mean, that's why they're bullies. I mean, the guy's bigger and he's picking on a smaller person. Uh, you know, you there's a pretty good 100% chance you know the outcome on that, unless the guy is Bruce Lee. So I just don't, I don't deal well with uh, with bullies. Uh, and then when I became a pastor, it's like I had this, uh, it started with this really precious young lady who had a couple of kids and she would drop them off at our kids program. And then she would come into the sanctuary for the service. She was always the last person in and she would be the first person out. And I didn't really get to, to know her that much. And then one Sunday, uh, when she came in, she had sunglasses on, which is a little unusual in a church. And then on this particular day, uh, I always went to the front of the church and I would shake hands with people as they're leaving. And on this particular day, she was the last person out. And she came up to me and I put my hand out and she took my hand with both of her hands and she had her head down and I could see tears coming down her cheek. And I lifted up the sunglasses and she had two black eyes. And I just, you know, I just became enraged that uh, somebody would do that to her. And then I, I found out it was her husband that did that. I mean, you're talking the, the, you know, you're doing that to your wife, doing that to the mother of your children. What kind of dirt bag does something like that? And I, I told her, I said, you know, when I found out it was her husband, I said, I'm going to go see him. And she was like, oh, no, 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 he'll hurt you. And I said, I'm not worried about it. Uh, but I I went to him, I went to him and I called him out. And I said, you know, I'd like to see how you would do against someone who's able to fight back. And anybody that would hit a woman is a dirtbag. And for you to hit the mother of your children, what kind of dirtbag are you? And so uh, he became a little belligerent and um, he just made the mistake of coming towards me. And we had the opportunity to dance out there for a little bit. And I was able to put him down on the ground and uh, he never hit her again, which was, you know, a good thing. So, yeah, you know, you're, you're not thinking that you're going to be dealing with things like that in the ministry. I'm thinking that I'm going to be dealing with somebody who's got depression or dealing with somebody who's got a moral failure or something like that. And then all of a sudden you're fighting battles with people who are being picked on. And uh, that was the first one. And then I just started having event after event of people who were being picked on by, it wasn't always one bully, but you know, there's, People, there's some people who don't respond to anything other than to have their attitude adjustment adjusted. And so uh, that was the way it worked for me. You know, this was back in the, uh, the late 80s and the early 90s. It's a different world that we live in today because I know here in the state of Florida, the, the people that carry guns, 
uh, has risen exponentially. And so in, in my day, you didn't see that. You know, you're just dealing with uh, brute force against brute force. But today, you know, you, you got to be real careful because you don't know who's carrying a gun today. And it's just a crazy, crazy world. But, you know, even even today in 2023, if I see somebody being picked on or I see somebody being abused, um, I, I still have to do something. So, you know, it might affect me one day where I bite off more than I chew. But. Uh, I can't change the way I do things. Uh, I just can't stand to see people abused or hurt. And um, if, if it's taken place, I've got to do something. Yeah. It all comes around to just doing the right thing. Right. Well, you know, I had a mentor and this is a, this is a little unusual cult. When I was growing up uh, in the sixties, I had a mentor who was a little black lady by the name of Miss Edna. And that's highly unusual for a little white boy in the 60s to have a black person who's mentor to him. Uh, but she was just the most precious, godly woman. And she used to love to quote Edmund Burke, uh, his quote that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And I, I grew up with that. And so, you know, I had to do something because of everything I had learned from her. Matter of fact, just about every chapter in my book is a lesson that I learned from Miss Edna. And uh, so I still, I, I still say that quote every now and then. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And when you see evil... I can't do nothing. I have to do something about it. And it's certainly, you know, like you had mentioned, it's harder to do these days because there's a lot of uncertainty and instability and crazy people just out there and about. And, yep. you know, you always want to do the right thing, but I think it's a hard thing to calculate in your brain to say, like, what is the risk I'm taking on? Mm -hmm. And I think it does get in the way of people saying that there's no longer a thought that says, is this morally right? Like, should this be happening? They're just like, well, if I try and stop this, am I going to get hurt? Right. Well, you know, I, I had a lot of injuries in professional wrestling. Um, I crushed my ankle. I had five knee surgeries, tore both ACLs, MCLs dislocated my hips, broke pelvis, I broke all my ribs, my my sternum, cracked sternum, both collarbones, I've had both shoulders surgically repaired, neck injuries, back injuries, uh, over 100 concussions. And so the great thing about my life is that God gave me a very high tolerance to physical pain. And so that was a good thing. I know what pain is. And so I'm, I'm not afraid of it if I face it, which was a great help for me. Have you found a lot of success helping to kind of instill, you know, some of Miss Edna's teachings onto other people to just say, like, we all need to do better. We all need to be better. You know, that's a great question because uh, it is it, it is absolutely true. I mean, I have. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've quoted her in messages that I preach. I uh, can't tell you how many times that I've quoted her, you know, uh, when I've had the opportunity to speak. I get invited. Um, they show the movie, and then after they show the movie, uh, I speak. So that's been just a weekly thing where I'm... <laughs> still dealing with lessons that I learned from her while I was growing up. So it's a good thing. No, I think a lot of us get, you know, somewhere along the way, we have a couple of those where we're like, we're some wisdom is imparted on us. And I feel almost, you know, lost when I can't do that for someone else. Or like, I want to be able to help them. And I just feel like I don't have that same, like the same charisma or the same like personality that whoever taught me did. 
And I'm like, how do I get this across? How do I teach people this, like this important life lesson? And I think a lot of that comes down to like, maybe they're not ready to hear it. Like, maybe it's not that like yeah. my message is any worse than the person who you know gave it to me. They're the person yeah. I'm telling it to just isn't ready for it. Well, I think that that's the case, but also, you know, I, I just encourage you not to, not to give up. One of the things that I often tell people is that failure is not final until you quit. I've had so many failures in my lifetime. You know, the thing is for both of us is just not giving up. Even when you fail, even when you don't hit a home run, even when you don't make that uh, connection or even when you're not able to help a person that doesn't mean you stop trying because I guarantee you there's going to be another opportunity to do it and so you just keep trudging on and you keep keep doing all you can to make it work I think that's a great message I was hoping to kind of hear you know more about the movie and uh, you know everything you're doing if anyone out there is interested in, in learning more yeah, the movie was really an awesome experience. They filmed it in uh, Canada, Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. And, um, you know, I had never been to the filming of a movie, didn't know anything about the movie business. And then uh, someone told me about IMDB, which is the, I guess, the International Movie Database. And so I started watching, you know, that. Uh, as far as the the mass sink, because they already had the title for it, <clears throat> and I started looking at the people who were going to be in the movie. And then when I saw uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper, who was going to be in the movie, I just flipped. And uh, I had worked against him about 25 years before that, but Roddy Piper was just an unbelievable person. He was a great wrestler, probably one of the greatest of all time. But he was also a great actor. You know, he, I think his first movie was called They Live, which which has a cult following. I mean, I don't know if it's on uh, Netflix or Prime, but you can find it. And uh, that movie was just a big hit and continues to be a big hit with people. So Roddy Piper was on, you know, I, I've watched uh, some of those old shows like something Walker, Texas Ranger, and with Chuck Norris. And lo and behold, I'm watching it one day, and there's Roddy Piper playing a part on that. And he was just in so many movies and so many television programs. And then to, to see him in The Masked Saint was a home run. And I guarantee you, the people that came around the movie set, the majority of them wanted to see Roddy Piper because he was such a, such a hit. Uh, the lady who plays uh, Miss Edna in the movie was the late actress, uh, Academy Award nominated actress, uh, Diane Carroll. Uh, she was such a beautiful woman. And uh, I think she was 79 when the movie was filmed. And uh, she, did a, she did a great job. She has since passed away. And uh, matter of fact, tragically, Roddy Piper, you know, we're the exact same age. And uh, the the movie finished filming at the end of November of 2013. And then he died at the end of July, 2014, which was tragic. Uh, but the guy who plays me is a young man by the name of Brett Grandstaff. He had been in several of Bruce Willis's movies. Uh, he had MMA experience. He was, he was a great athlete and he did a, he did a, a good job of portraying me in the movie. Uh, the bad guy in the movie is a, the guy they call the Reaper, and uh, he's played by James Preston Rogers. And James Preston Rogers did a, I mean, he just knocked it out of the park. That guy did a great, great job. He was he was signed by the WWE, uh, but he got so much work in the movie business that he gave up his wrestling career to, to do movies all the time. And uh, he's just... I mean, if you look at the list of things, um, I, the last thing he did, uh, I think they taped last year, was uh, Beverly Hills Cop 4 with Eddie Murphy. Uh, so he, he's in that. Uh, he was in Adam Sandler's movie, Pixel. I, I, can't, I could go on and on about his list, but he was super, super guy. The uh, young lady that plays my wife, 
Uh, her name is Lori Jean Chorostecki. Uh, she also had just done a lot of stuff. Uh, she was one of her latest one was uh, the Reacher series, you know, Jack Reacher series. Yeah. Uh, she, she, play, she played on that. Uh, the young lady that plays our daughter just really has knocked it out of the park. Uh, her name was T.J. McGibbons. She has just been in countless movies. She was in uh, War with Grandpa with Robert De Niro. Uh, she was in The Last X-Men, Apocalypse. Uh, she played the, the granddaughter. She was in a movie with uh, Martin Landau and Christopher Plummer called Remembrance, I think. So she's just done a super, super job. So, uh, And then you know, my wife and I love those Christmas movies. And lo and behold, we're watching one of those Christmas movies. And there's TJ uh, playing the daughter of Alicia Witt on one of the uh, Hallmark movies. So it's, it's just really a hoot uh, when you meet people and then you see them, you know, you go to a movie and you see people that were in your movie uh, up there on the screen. Uh, uh, great, great movie. Uh, it's, Right now, it's showing on Amazon Prime, so you can watch it for free on Amazon Prime. And uh, because it's on Amazon Prime, I get I get messages every week from people who've seen it, and they start looking how to get in touch with me, and they get on Facebook, uh, or they find out that I'm on staff at First Baptist Orlando, and I just get all these emails and messages from people that have watched the movie and loved it, so... It, even though it you know it came out in 2016 in theaters, uh, it's still making a great impression on a lot of people. Yeah, it was your legacy, and then it became like an on-screen version of your legacy. And now, you know, you yeah. still get to to hear from people that are are touched by it. That's really cool. Yep, yeah. yeah. and I love that too. I just really enjoy talking to people that uh, love the movie and love the book. Well, that's awesome. When did you do the book? Uh, the book actually came out um, back in 2008. I self-published the book. And then when you know the movie people started talking to me, um, I was able to get it published with a more reputable publisher in New York City, uh, Morgan James. They published it. And so when the book was re-released, it actually, the book released, I think, on January the 5th of 2016, and then the movie was in theaters on January the 8th of 2016. So they kind of coincided together. Well, I mean, that all sounds super fun. It gives some people, you know, that are out there. And I'm sure I've had an interesting time listening to this conversation because it's been, you know, a very fun journey. It gives them yeah. more to look forward to. So, yeah, yeah, thank you so much for coming onto the show. And I hope people reach out and they watch the movie and they read the book and they, you know, just find more. Well, I thank you so much, Colton, for having me. They can go to my website, uh, which is www.themass, that's M-A-S-K-E-D, themassaint.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. Uh, they can contact me on Facebook. And I always, I always respond to people. It may take me a week or two, but I always respond. Um, my third book um, I just signed a contract with the publisher on that. It's called Mr. President. And it's about the uh, world heavyweight wrestling champion becoming the president of the United States. And then he puts his wrestling buddies in his cabinet. And it just, you can imagine the furor that that would create in the United States of America. But it, it's a comedy, a political comedy, and it's hilarious. And I can't wait for, can't wait for it to come out. Yeah, that sounds really good. It's yeah, interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope people keep an eye out for those things. And if they do pick up your books, especially if they're picking up through places like Amazon, remember to leave good reviews for them because that helps other people find these books later and it helps uh, promote your creators like yourself. Yeah. yeah, it does. Thank you so much. What do you think? I've never been a big wrestling fan, but even I see it marketed everywhere. So are you a fan? Have you ever seen an in-person show? Who's your favorite? What's it like in your country? Let me know. And I know I wasn't around last Thursday, but life's been real crazy, and sometimes you have to make time for yourself. So, I'm sorry, everybody. We're officially midway through May, and here's the rankings so far. 
Number one, the United States, with Oregon, Texas, and Arizona as top states. Number two, Canada, overtaking Australia with Ontario in the lead, but Saskatchewan not far behind. Number three, Australia, with Victoria leading the attempt to take back that number two spot. Number four, the United Kingdom. And number five, Sweden, only one listener ahead of India and led by Skane. Do all the good stuff for the show, please. Rate, review, like, subscribe. Dumb Enough Podcast at gmail.com or on any of the social media if you want to reach out to me. Otherwise, that's it for today. Have a great week, and I will actually see you all back here on Thursday. Stay dumb. <laughs>